practicing homelessness are in LA. Why is that? And why do some shy away from available services? My name is Lee Hopper and I write about research at USC. I'm here today with three experts who set out to find answers. So you guys followed 26 veterans experiencing homelessness for over a year. Why did you take this approach and what can you tell us about the sample? Hi, I, I'll take that first question. Um, my name is Sarah Hunter. I'm a senior behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation and director of uh, RAND Center on Housing and Homelessness. And we were really interested in understanding why, given the services available to veterans in Los Angeles and the fact that the West LA VA campus represents the largest medical center in the nation for veterans, why so many veterans were unhoused in Los Angeles. So and, and many of the veterans are within a couple of blocks from, from that campus, right? Exactly. So um, I'll let Rick tell you a little more about how we recruited veterans, um, but we purposely um, wanted to recruit veterans who had a way to get to that campus and understand why they continued to live on the streets. Thanks, Sarah. I'm Rick Garvey. I'm the survey research group at the RAND Corporation, and I was the one who led the team of interviewers who went onto the streets to try to locate these veterans and then maintained contact with them every month for a year. And as Sarah mentioned, we tried to find people who were on the street in a proximate location to the West LA VA. So that included Hollywood, that included Venice and Santa Monica, and that included West LA and Inglewood. Yeah, Lee, and if I could just add a little bit more context to this. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Henwood. Uh, I was the co-lead of the study with uh, Sarah, and I'm an associate professor at uh, the USC Suzanne Dvorak Peck School of Social Work. I also direct our Center for Homelessness, Housing, and Health Equity Research. Progress. And, and part of, you know, what we wanted to look at was the context of, you know, we know nationally that uh, veterans homelessness has decreased quite dramatically over the past 10 years from so, some 74,000 homeless vets down to about 37,000 uh, homeless vets nationally. LA does have the highest concentration of homeless veterans in the US. Um, and so, you know, we really wanted to understand why that was the case. Also part of the study, we wanted to understand a bit more about using mobile phone technology um, for research purposes, but also implications for service delivery. And I think the last part just to mention up front was that while we didn't set out or anticipate to look at the impact of a of a the COVID-19 pandemic, in the middle of our data collection um, is when uh, the pandemic began. And so we had to adjust and and try to factor that into to our study design and to see the impact on, on homeless veterans. So some of what I understand is some of the uh, members of the sample group weren't satisfied with housing options. Um, why was that? And, and how does that contribute to the perception that uh, some homeless individuals prefer being homeless? Sarah, can you maybe talk a little bit about that? Sure, we, we asked folks what um, their most important life goal was and how competent they were to obtain housing. And what we found is the majority of our sample um, deemed housing as their most important life goal. But in terms of their competence, um, that wasn't uh, rated as highly. Uh, many people have become disillusioned with the system and become, you know, sort of resigned to living on the streets, given the challenges they had faced with obtaining stable housing. And I'll, I'll add into that. There are a lot of different types of housing that homeless folks are trying to get into, and that can range everything from their own apartment to a shared housing situation, a group shelter. There were hotel rooms that were offered. There were even safe campgrounds that were set up that where people could actually stay outside but in a more structured environment. And we found that a lot of the veterans, everybody's different and not one size fits all. And so it was really important to try to understand what people really wanted and needed before just trying to place them in one type of housing because it just didn't work. 
So are you saying that, uh, you know, perhaps one option uh, might not suit them, but, but another option would? Absolutely. Like there are some options where people could bring their belongings and there were other options where they couldn't. There were some of our veterans had pets, dogs that could come or not into various housing options. Oftentimes a veteran might be with a partner who may not be a veteran. So they may not be allowed in a VA sponsored housing program. Um, one of the interesting things about this project too was that we followed people over the course of an entire year. And during that year, we watched them go in and out of housing. So they would try a housing option and it wouldn't work for them. And then they would be back on the street. And Lee, we, Lee, if I, oh, go Lee, ahead, if I sorry. Just, uh, part of your initial question was just, I think the perspective that the public might have of that people actually are choosing to be out on the streets. And I think, you know, what was very clear from, from our findings were, were that everyone we interviewed had an interest, had a desire, you know, to look for and find suitable housing. And in fact, you know, many of them throughout the course of the study found some version of a housing option. Um, you know, and, and this is all in the report that's been released, but, you know, we saw about 17 of the 26 veterans got into some sort of uh, housing option for them. It didn't always work, I think, to Rick's point. Um, and so, you, you know, so they, there, there might, there may have been only three that actually got into permanent housing uh, during the course of the study. But I think to your point, right, it, it had more to do with the options that were available and not being a good fit than it did people having some innate desire to be homeless or out on the streets or, you know, kind of those perceptions. So I, I think that's an important takeaway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think that um, there's a perception among the public that, uh, you know, perhaps this individual experiencing homelessness should just take the option that is being offered to them? Like, like there's this idea of people being resistant to help. Uh, I believe that yeah. maybe in uh, I, in your report, you talked about how uh, rather than looking at it as people being resistant, perhaps the options are somewhat resistant or have built in barriers. Yeah, I, I'll just quickly um, mention, right. I, I think there, there's even a term, I mean, people talk about this population as being service resistant. And I think what we found is actually people are pretty engaged in trying to figure out different options for themselves. We, we saw that a lot throughout the course of the year, whether it's, you know, treatment, whether it's mental health services, whether it's going, you know, trying these different housing programs. Um, so, you know, we didn't really see much evidence that people were somehow resistant to services. What we did find was that, again, that fit between what they needed when they needed it and what the, the system was able to offer didn't always match up. So, so I think that's right. I think shifting it away from looking at the individuals resistant more to the impact that the, the way we design our services um, is an important shift. Um, thanks, Ben. So Rick, I think uh, you mentioned when we were discussing this yesterday that there was a lot of turnover among uh, caseworkers that, that work with veterans. And so that presents kind of another issue it really does. And it comes back to what Ben mentioned is that there are services that are available. The problem is it's very hard to match services with people if you don't develop a good relationship and you don't really understand what that person needs. The VA outreach team in particular, they do an excellent job, but they're very much understaffed. They only have a handful of people to handle the entire Los Angeles County area. And it takes a long time to cover that area. So you might be a very good outreach worker. You might be amazing at getting people to open up to you, to understand what their needs are, but your caseload is such that you can only really touch base with them every couple of weeks, and that's just not enough. Right, right. So, um, Sarah, um, in the middle of this study came the COVID pandemic. Tell me how that uh, affected your work? I mean, did it throw everything up into the air initially or what happened? Yeah, really good question because as Rick said, you know, most of our work was done in person. We actually went out on the streets and did these in-depth interviews every month. 
Now, some of our vets by that time had moved away and we were doing um, phone calls with them. So what we did was we converted to doing phone calls with everyone. Now, some of our vets were still living outside and didn't have a cell phone. Um, so we got permission from our IRB. You know, it took us a while to kind of figure out the best approach because we were all learning about the pandemic at the same time. Um, and having our team for those folks go out with a lot of PPE um, and actually give a phone to someone in the park, um, stand uh, a good distance away from them, give them a mask, um, gloves, hand sanitizer, conduct the interview by phone, and then you know get the phone back and 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 move on. So. Um, and also, um, we did this uh, an add-on study where we collected information specifically on how people um, responded to the pandemic, and Ben can tell you a lot more about that effort. Okay, um, and I'm not sure which we should go to first, what uh, Sarah is introducing or this the whole thing about cell phones. I know that that's pretty important, too, in terms yeah, of helping veterans access services, so... Take it away, Ben. Yeah, they're 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 actually pretty connected, and I think think Rick might be able to to put a little bit more light on the subject. But um, you know, we actually wrote about this early on in the study because it wasn't you know the the entire world was trying to figure out how to pivot with the pandemic, and and of course that uh, impacted our sample as well, and in ways that I I don't think a lot of people anticipated. So it's not you know part of our our need to pass out cell phones to conduct these service surveys from afar wasn't because people didn't have cell phones. It's because, you know, what, how they were used to charging their cell phones, right. And um, to be able to use them, whether it's, you know, accessing, you know, an outlet at a coffee shop or a shelter or wherever it might be, a lot of those places shut down. Right. And so, oh, wow. the, right. The cell phone that is a lifeline for a lot of us, including homeless vets, what were no longer, you know, they were no longer able to use them. Um, so, you know, so I think that impacted our sample quite a bit and the way we did the study. Um, and, you know, that's just, that's just kind of one example that I don't think, you know, people think about how, how this affected things. So I, I can tell more, tell you more about the sort of our sub study on the pandemic, but Rick, I don't know if you have any, uh, examples to, in terms of how things shifted with the pandemic you want to share. Well, yeah, a few things. Uh, the one thing that you bring up, the charging issue was huge. Um, the main area where veterans and homeless people in general were getting these types of services, charging your phone, were at the libraries. And the libraries are one of the first things that closed during COVID. So that became a real challenge. And fast food restaurants were the other place that people would get their phones charged. And those also closed to walk in. So a lot of people had a phone, but had no way to charge it. The other positive thing that came out of COVID in a, in a weird way was that it did open up some housing opportunities that had not existed before COVID. And the one that jumps right out are the hotel rooms. So the project room key, which turned into the project home key that opened up hotel rooms for people to come right off the street into the hotel rooms. We had a lot of vets use that program and it was wonderful. And it allowed them to shower and to have places to put their belongings and it really opened up opportunities for vets to not think about some of the daily issues. You know, charging your phone can take all day if you're a homeless veteran. But if you have a hotel room and you get it charged, you don't need to worry about that anymore. And then you can start thinking about other things. And so we thought that was really important during COVID. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's the kind of level of detail that most of us aren't really thinking about in terms of the challenges faced by people who are homeless. So um, I have a question from a viewer, uh, uh, and that is, uh, what can we learn from the successful effort by the VA to house the veterans that were living on Veterans Row in Los Angeles? Is that the same thing as Operation Room Key that you just mentioned, Rick? It's a little different. I'll let Sarah tell you. Okay. Well, I think it's really too soon to really say it was a success. We know they brought them onto the VA campus to stay, to stay in tents, um, but those veterans have not um, been placed in permanent housing. So 
they're at risk to um, end up back in the streets. Um, so time will tell whether um, the VA is successful in placing them um, in you know, a permanent housing solution. Um, you know, as we say in our report and um, in the op-ed piece that I did yesterday is that many other cities um, and states actually have, have solved this issue. Um, and they place people into housing, veterans into housing within, you know, sometimes 30 days. And that's, you know, that, that's a goal that Los Angeles should consider. Um, most folks have to wait months, sometimes years to obtain a permanent housing solution. So, so what, be a multi-pronged effort, you know, to increase our affordable housing stock, as well as, you know, build out robust outreach services. Um, so, you know, anyways, it, it really is going to um, need, you know, attention and emphasis by a large, you know, sort of component agencies to address. So what is it that Los Angeles is missing that these other cities who dealt with it more successfully have? Is it the housing stock itself? Well, I think affordable housing is definitely missing in Los Angeles in, in general. And, yeah, but I think, you know, the veterans actually have a, an option that non-veterans don't have, which is the VA campus. And there was a master settlement in 2016 with a plan to build over 1,200 permanent supportive housing units on that campus. That campus is 400 acres. There's plenty of space to build housing um, to support veterans in our community that you know, isn't available to non-veterans. And the VA has failed to do that. And now they've extended that plan out to 2031 because they didn't meet the goals outlined in the initial 2016 plan. In fact, only 5%, 59 units have been built on the campus when there should be hundreds of units built by now. So guys, I just want to let you know that we're about halfway through. We have 13 minutes left. Great. Lee, if I could just kind of weigh, weigh in too, because I, I think part of your question is, you know, we know we, we have solutions that work for this problem. And, you know, homelessness, it, it is a problem that responds well to resources. And part of why so many other, you know, cities and locales have been able to reduce veterans homelessness is because there has been both um, an infusion of resources and an approach that works, a housing first approach that has low barrier into, into permanent housing. It's not that we're not trying to do that here in Los Angeles, but I think what we saw was to Rick and Sarah's point is that, you know, housing first is predicated on the availability of housing and that's in short supply, affordable housing in Los Angeles. So um, it, it sort of undercuts an ability to really move pe people quickly from from the streets um, into you know into a unit. And and in fact, we didn't really see that happen at all during during the study. Even even people who were assigned vouchers, right? We had one individual who received a voucher, but, but wasn't able to use it, right? Um, because the time ran out. And I think. That idea that you can just give someone a voucher and they could navigate the system, you know, I think we know that's not going to work. There's just it's it's too competitive and there needs to be supports around that. So so LA is is unique in in some ways. Um, on the other on the other hand, there are units available, right? And so it's how do we secure them and how do we get people in quickly? And that that has really become a, a, a challenge. Another thing I think we should mention that is unique about Los Angeles is just our weather, right? So if I were homeless in Minnesota, I would probably want to come to Los Angeles. And we found that a lot of our veterans did actually come to LA from other places. And so, you know, we've become sort of the area that of last resort for people to come where they can at least survive outdoors until they do find a place to get inside. Well, that's really interesting. I think uh, when we were Talk, talking yesterday, one of you mentioned that in, in some cases, the veteran, some of these veterans actually chose to leave LA 
Can you talk about those individuals and um, you know what it was about their situation that led them to make that decision? Well, I think um, you know I, there wasn't like one main story. The the reasons why people left LA were varied. Um, typically, they did have a connection somewhere else, and they had a resource. Um, that meant they would have a better housing option if they left LA. So, you know, they were offered a unit um, or a placement outside of Los Angeles, or um, they knew they would have a better chance of being placed in housing once they moved and reunited with family and friends. Um, so we had um, Ralph, he was 51. We found him outside a library in Hollywood, he wasn't doing well. Um, he was literally, I think, sleeping in a bush. And by the end of the study, he was living in Atlanta. He had obtained a job. He, um, his HIV and his PTSD had improved, his symptoms had improved because he was able to get care at the VA there, get connected, um, get therapy and become uh, medication compliant, which you know, obviously had difficulty doing that, living on the streets of Los Angeles. Um, and that bus voucher was provided by a non-VA entity by that path. So he had failed several times to obtain housing through the VA in LA. So we, for the first half of our study, he was saying, oh, you know, I have this voucher, it's coming any day now. And then it would, it would fall through. Um, and so that ended up to be the best option available to him um, as and, one example. Lee, I think, I think it's probably also important to note that, you know, what we're discussing here in terms of people, vets coming from outside of LA to Los Angeles while they're homeless is, is actually not so typical of the LA homeless population. Mo most people experiencing homelessness in LA are either from this area or were housed and then became homeless. So it's interesting that in our sample, we saw this a little different. And I think for me, there are kind of two takeaways from that. And one I think <laughs> really important was what Sarah's talking about or like, where are the resources? Where can people like afford and find affordable housing? I think the other important piece though, is it's, it's about co social connections, right? And so people wanna go where they have social connections. And I think we saw that play out with a few people who left um, to get to move to get housing elsewhere. And for a lot of our vets, and I think people experiencing homelessness in general, they've lost a lot of that social support and social connection. And that that needs to be a key part of, you know, ha how the engagement happens and the, and the solutions as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we have seven minutes left. Let's see. Um, I know that in your sample were a few women. Uh, did they have different needs than the male veterans that, that we're discussing? Can you talk a little bit about how that population is different? We had one woman in particular who was living in her vehicle with her young child. And so she was struggling to keep the child in school while she was you know, trying to find housing for them, trying to find a job, trying to survive and yet getting up every morning to bring her child to school was a struggle. And that was something we didn't see with any of the men. Wow. Did, was she able to find housing by the end of the study? Rick, do you know if she, she was, was able placed to in a, Yeah, she was placed in a transitional program um, before the end of the study. So yeah, she- She did, she ended houses. up with an apartment. Yeah, so. Yeah, it, it's also lead to your question. It's worth noting our sample, you know, the, the vast majority of homeless vets are male. I think we intentionally tried to sort of, quote unquote, oversample women, um, right? And, it, and it's interesting that uh, the two of the women in our sample did have kids in custody of their kids, um, which is a bit different. Um, so, you know, we, we intentionally try and try to, to get a, a bit of a more diverse sample that's not necessarily reflective and to really, you know, understand their stories. So I'm glad you're asking about that. So with just six minutes left, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, what do you want to look at next? Like what, what open questions or, or with the information that you gathered, what, is it, what does it make you want to look at next? 
Well, we are following up with um, a new study. Um, it's a enumeration and housing preferences survey study um, where we're, um, you know, every year and, you know, Ben's really engaged in this work. Um, LASA does a point count of the population, but what we're, what we're doing instead is looking again longitudinally, so doing a count um, just in a few hot spots around the area because it's all we have funding for, but um, to look at the number of people that are living on the streets in these areas, including Venice, Hollywood, Skid Row, and the vet, um, Veterans Row on San Vicente, and then doing a survey with a random sample about their housing needs and preferences and questions that aren't asked in the LASA demographic survey, um, like their experiences, are they on a wait list? Have they been housed before? Um, what, you know, what sort of housing would they accept? Um, why or why not? Um, so we can better understand and tailor the housing options. To, so, you know, we're not, we're not creating housing that's not going to fit with the with the needs of the population or their preferences. Right. So one thing we're um, we started in October and we're going to continue on through the new year. Also, to because of these new um, enforcements going on, um, we want to see if people move or shift um, due to those new enforcements that are being put in place across the city of LA. Okay. Yeah, if I, I just just a little bit more context on what Sarah's saying, you know, I think uh, for the past you know several years, really, the system's been designed in terms of targeting those who are most vulnerable, and there has been a shift to really taking a more place based approach, like we saw with with the veterans on on Veterans Road, trying to go to an area and then figure out how to provide services. So it'll be interesting to see is that more efficient? Does that lead to more displacement, um, you know, in terms of targeting those areas? I, I do agree with Sarah. I think this issue around housing and service preference and understanding that is really key. Um, if we want, you know, if we want to do this well and respond to the, the needs that people have. So yeah, that, that, that's important work. I think it's also worth noting, you know, this is a study that was done independent of the VA. And so in a lot of ways, we didn't have access to VA records, though I should mention all, our entire sample, you know, they they did they did have VA records. We confirmed that. And so now we're actually doing a follow-up study um, uh, in collaboration with some VA researchers uh, to try to better understand our sample and a bit of their service utilization. So, so we are continuing this work. One thing that's been very interesting in looking at this new project is that people are trying to get housed. They're, they're doing what they're asked for. They're answering all sorts of questions. They're doing assessments. They're giving up personal information and they're getting their hopes up. And then what we're finding is the options that they want aren't available. And some of the things that they're promised are not actually come through. And then they get angry, bitter, burned out and less likely to wanna to try to reach out a second time. Yeah, I can see that being the case. I mean, if you're uh, providing a lot of information and stating over and over again what would help you, but then that kind of help doesn't really come, that could be really frustrating. Yeah. And that's, I think, part of the outreach services issue is that um, outreach services staff are kind of hamstrung. They, you know, they try to build rapport and engagement, but yet they don't have anything tangible to offer folks or so they aren't, they can't offer something that really fits their needs and preferences, then that, you know, that relationship doesn't, you know, work out. So um, we need to build a re robust um, resources um, so that the outreach services team can fulfill, you know, sort of their side of the equation. So we have 60 seconds left. Is there a major takeaway that we should share before, before fake Facebook kicks us out? Well, one thing that I would just like to say in terms of, you know, the fact that the study occurred during the pandemic was that, you know, that was a, a stressful, distressing event for everyone. But what's interesting, you know, while our sample was fully aware and taking protective measures, you know, housing or lack thereof was really 
more of a driver of people's well-being, right, and their stress levels. And I think that just goes to show how important that issue is, even, you know, even during a, a global pandemic. Thank you guys so much for, for doing this. It was fascinating. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Bye -bye. Lee. Thanks for the opportunity.